Your Excellencies, Honorable Ministers, Distinguished Participants, Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen, Good morning and welcome to Kenya. This African moment is a global moment where climate action is actually green growth. I am delighted to be here with you for a number of reasons. First, I am excited to participate in this summit as a scientist who has done some research on ecological impacts of human activity on fragile and precious ecosystems, including rivers and wetlands. I am also privileged to be leading the Kenyan delegation to the Africa Climate Summit. And besides, I have the honor for the time being of serving the young green continent of the future as the chair of CAHOST, the Committee of African Heads of State on Climate Change. And for hosting this event with my good brothers from the AU, and I dare say, this conversation is happening in the right city where the UN has the global environmental capital where we have UNEP. I am therefore highly encouraged by your strong response for our invitation to attend and participate in this inaugural transformative continental assembly convened to focus on climate action from the standpoint of generating African solutions to global challenges. The participation in the numerous events that make up this summit has so far demonstrated impressive commitment, extraordinary enthusiasm exemplary motivation and unparalleled determination to confront the problems, clarify issues, engage inclusively, and define a unique strategy platform for the implementation of bold interventions to catalyze progress in the global climate action agenda. I welcome you to Nairobi our burgeoning and sleepless green city in the sun that is bounded by a national wildlife park and a close canopy of indigenous forest. In between, our capital pulsates with the restless energy of community, enterprise, industry, innovation, learning, fun, and adventure. Please, feel at home and find time to enjoy the sights and sounds of our city and country. And when I say welcome home, it's both figuratively but also in reality. I did say yesterday, I did inform the participants yesterday that Kenya, where you are sitting, a few kilometers from where you are sitting, has been discovered the earliest remains of man on earth. And it means that before you guys went all over the place in Africa, Europe, and America, and the rest of the world, we all began from here. And therefore, it is correct for me to tell you, welcome home. And while you are away, 
These are the greetings, just so that you find your way around. Jumbo is the greetings. Maybe, and when somebody else tells you Jumbo, you reply Jumbo. It's simple. Jumbo. Good. I will take you one more step. When you want to say, how are you? You say, Mambo. Simple. And then the reply is, Boa. Okay, let's go. Mambo. Good. There you go. So, I'm sure you'll find your way around with that. Africa is a very young continent. Our median age is 19. Africa's youthfulness is precisely the attribute that has inspired African leaders to imagine a future where Africa finally steps into the stage as an economic and industrial power, an effective and positive actor on a global arena. I am very proud because of this realization and it has motivated Africa's leaders to create meaningful opportunities for young people to participate in, contribute to, and take charge of consequential endeavors in many sectors. This bold policy is already transforming the strategic landscape of climate action and is swiftly propelling our continent to a focal point of global sustainability agenda. On Sunday, at the Youth Summit, we saw for ourselves the immensity of the potential that we can unleash simply by facilitating positive youth action at all levels in every sector. Potential and opportunity are both futuristic propositions. The African Climate Summit has been designed to enable us to locate our intense engagements and the most energized discourse in order to facilitate imaginative, problem-solving, and innovative interventions that are bold enough to meet the critical challenges of the present and future times. This is why potential, opportunity, the future, and youth are recurrent themes that underlie our interactions in this summit. We have convened here to consult, deliberate, and collaborate in imagining and designing the future of climate action globally and its implications for African aspirations to achieve shared prosperity within one generation. This summit is dedicated exclusively to the transformation of potential into opportunity, the conversion of ideas into actions, and the turning of plans into results. It is about creating a firm consensus, designing effective strategies, securing commitments, and forging transformative partnerships that will drive climate action in the direction and at the rate required to pull our continent and planet back from the brink of a climate disaster. The urgency of this moment is informed by the knowledge that climate change is the greatest challenge, not only to the well-being of humanity, but to every existence of life on Earth, and that only urgent and coordinated action on a global scale can stop the impending catastrophe by lowering greenhouse gas emissions and reducing their concentration in the atmosphere. This is an immense and formidable challenge, even at the best of times. However, the time we are in and in which we must implement this urgent and daunting undertaking is a complicated and difficult time for nations throughout the world. Regional conflict with geopolitical ramifications have compounded the disruptive impacts 
of the COVID-19 pandemic to throw global supply chains into disarray, slowing down economies, raising the cost of living, suppressing economic growth, and straining food systems to a breaking point. The complex interplay of these circumstances also combined with other localized vulnerabilities to drive adversity in many communities, placing intense pressure on governments to reconfigure, to reconfigure resources, allocation, and other strategic interventions. In short, it would be understandable if African leaders prioritized other commitments and relegated climate action to an afterthought. This is why I proudly celebrate the courage and imagination with which the people of Africa and their leaders have converged with extraordinary focus and commitment on the climate agenda, not as an additional or peripheral concern for public policy, but as the foremost priority and the defining intervention in our collective journey to shared prosperity. As a result, patient consultation, thorough debate, determined collaboration, and bold confrontation of facts in issue, it has become clear to us at the African Union, under the ages of the Committee of African Heads of State on Climate Change, that tackling climate change also produces the solutions for the complex interconnected crisis that we face today. This is what this summit is designed to underscore. Collectively, we hold the power to transform the current continental and global trajectory. More critically, we all have an urgent responsibility to do so with a sense of collective purpose that matches the sense of urgency demonstrated by Africa's young people at the Youth Summit earlier this week. Although we are gathered there, we are gathered here to explore the means by which we can unite in action for the greater good, we have taken full account of the fact that we are not all at the same place in terms of our experiences with climate change. All countries struggle to achieve socioeconomic progress under various constraints due to a range of complex and interconnected historical, political and economic factors. African countries struggle with unique, inordinate and incredibly complex structural drawbacks in the quest to provide opportunities for their peoples to achieve prosperity. Nevertheless, we have all, in our different ways, succeeded in making progress over the years amid these extraordinary difficulties. The tragedy of climate change is that it is relentlessly eating away at this progress. And going by evidence based on scientific projections, its appetite to consume our GDP will grow in years to come. We are already losing between 5 and 15 percent of our GDP growth every year to the adverse impacts of climate change. At the same time, the cost of adaptation continues to rise along with the cost of living, while the cost of development capital for African countries remains prohibitive as millions of our youth remain unemployed. Only rapid and inclusive transformation powered by robust industrialization can place us firmly on a path towards sustainable resolution of these challenges. A sound understanding of the nature and causes of climate change coupled with our experience of its devastating effects has provided us with a robust early warning system that the classical economic development progression precedent is not available for us as a pathway to this transformation. As Africans, 
we are strongly persuaded that not only is it urgent for us to execute an audacious leapfrogging of the traditional developmental pathway to industrialization, but urgent ecological imperatives also dictate that we must do, we must go green first before industrializing and not vice versa, like the advanced industrial economies had the luxury to do. I emphasize this point to underscore the principle underlying Africa's position on climate action agenda and the foundation of our strategic, institutional, and policy direction. We have an unprecedented opportunity to abandon the well-trodden yet unsustainable path of the past and forge a new route that aligns economic inclusion and shared prosperity with climate commitment imperatives. Africa's low rate of greenhouse gas emissions must not relegate us to the margins and footnotes of the global climate agenda. Africa must step forward as the cornerstone around which effective climate solutions are built. Yesterday, I encouraged participants in this summit to disregard the grievance standpoint and instead consider climate action imperative through an opportunity lens. As soon as we do that, a nexus of feasible sequences beginning, begins to emerge in an unbroken continuum from potential to opportunity, and through investments and technological in innovation into green manufacturing and industrialization, including shared prosperity. Our untapped renewable energy potential, together with the world's youngest population of skilled, motivated, and knowledgeable industrial men and women, along with Africa's abundant endowment of natural assets from carbon sinks to arable land and mineral wealth, confer on us the indispensable fundamentals to swiftly become a cost-competitive industrial hub with ample capacity to decarbonize global manufacturing and green the economies of our continent, our neighborhoods, and the globe. It is good for us to be open about the need to confront a couple of basic truths. First, it is demonstrably clear that none of the world's industrial, industrialized nations will be able to achieve their net zero goals within the time indicated by scientists to avert further warming. Secondly, unlocking Africa's potential to undertake economic transformation along a green trajectory is the most feasible, just, and efficient way to attain a net zero world by 2050. With those two combined, Africa's capacity to limit its own emissions is the clearest pathway to enable the world to achieve its climate action targets. Africa's opportunity in, is a global opportunity and a chance for humanity to redeem its intergenerational legacy. Scientific experts have consistently demonstrated from analyzing available evidence and making projections that this can be achieved while generating jobs in their millions, creating enormous investment opportunities, and catalyzing unprecedented economic growth. Under a proper green growth paradigm, climate action also serves as a robust engine for poverty reduction 
employment and wealth creation, and economic transformation. By definition, effective climate action must entail technological leapfrogging to disrupt and invent the industrial development pathway and go green first. It must also involve effective decarbonization of global production and supply chains and deliberate efforts to remove carbon from the atmosphere at scale. Understood this way, green growth aligns perfectly with opportunity-oriented perspectives of climate change, which presents Africa with its most important means of achieving stability, prosperity, and development beyond middle-income industrial status. To achieve green growth, we in Africa have committed to move with speed and under various effective frameworks to develop the necessary instruments, institutions, policies, and strategies through which we shall design and implement incentives that will accelerate the delivery of priority actions. We shall also support our youth, especially those in enterprise to enable innovation and deliver localized solutions for the benefit of our communities and at the same time attract other African and international investors to finance climate action. Every step of this journey will require partnership that facilitate collaboration and multilateral collective action to achieve just development financing mechanisms, deliver equitable access to markets for Africa's green products and services, and a just regime that provides liquidity, debt relief, and affordable investment capital everywhere on the continent at scale. We are all connected to our common humanity and a shared stake in the vitality and livability of our planet. We are also bound firmly by the fact that Earth is all we have, that we have no other home, and that no alternative planet to resort to when things burn here. The most salient implication of this knowledge is that we cannot approach climate action and human development from a disconnected or adversarial standpoint. We cannot pursue climate action through in, uh, insular, solitary policies. Global warming cannot be mitigated by air conditioning our little pockets and corners of the world. Prosperity cannot and must not be pursued in a zero-sum, exclusive fashion because the resulting injustice and in, in, inequality are the drivers of inequity, poverty, conflict, and activities that threaten biodiversity and encourage pollution. We are all interconnected. That is a statement of fact. And this existential moment provides us with a unique opportunity to reconnect with our shared humanity. In this summit, you will have heard and will continue to learn more about the bold, transformative, innovative fruits of partnerships, cooperation, and collaboration that are already underway in various parts of Africa. I invite you to pay, to pay close attention to, and to as many of these cases as possible and assure you that you will be surprised, challenged, and inspired by the many wonderful demonstrations of bold initiatives in the face of many opportunities. That is the essence of this summit. It is an orientation, and in fact an orientation run, designed to familiarize us with our journey into the future, driven by African solutions, powered by African resources and anchored on African opportunities. The collaboration 
I have in mind must be bold in ambition, broad in scope for their vision, deep in terms of diversity of their stakeholders, and long in terms of their geographical reach. An impressive example that I have had opportunity to interact with is the Global Center for Adaptation, an organization based in Rotterdam in the, in the Netherlands whose constitution is an appealing emblem of our aspiration from the aspirational design of its global headquarters and futuristic regional headquarters in Nairobi, comprising green walls and roofs as well as rain gardens to the collaborative culture of its staff. Unsurprisingly, the center is intended to inspire the world to thrive with nature instead of pursuing the dangerous course of seeking to thrive at the expense of nature. The center spearheads the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program, a focal point collaboration with the University of Nairobi, Africa Development Bank, and the Africa Union Commission as part of the continent's response to the climate crisis. I am delighted to announce that as an outcome of this summit today, Kenya will host the GCA Africa headquarters here in Nairobi. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, it has taken tremendous courage, effort, and determination to leave behind us the old continent that was historically profiled with intense negativity. The Africa whose people neither are there to be seen or heard has summoned the confidence and readiness to confront, to confront hard facts, engage truthfully, and forge a common position on critical issues that project a new, bold, radically transformative voice into the global discourse. And let me say here that we have discussed potential. And it is true, we need to have a conversation about Africa's potential. Why? Because we have been profiled negatively. The continent of disease, war, poverty. But we are stepping forward to say, look here, Africa is the continent with 60% of the world's renewable energy assets. Whether you talk about wind, whether you talk about solar, geothermal, hydropower. Number two, we're saying Africa is the continent that has 40% of the world's critical minerals for energy transition. Whether you talk about nickel, cobalt, lithium, manganese, this is where those reserves are. Number three, this is the continent, the youngest continent with a median age of 19. 25% of the world's population will be living in this continent by 2050. We will have 40% of the world's workforce by 2100. This is the continent number four that has two thirds of the world's uncultivated arable land that can transform through smart agriculture into the store, the production store of the world. And number five, this is the continent that is the lungs of the world. We have the largest natural carbon sequestration infrastructure. In fact, we dare say, in, if there was a company for collecting garbage globally, and I'm talking about Gap, uh, carbon garbage, Africa would have the largest shares because we have the largest lungs. The only problem is that those who 
produce the garbage, refuse to pay their bills. And profile the company as broke when it is actually them who have refused to pay the bills. So that is our continent. It's a continent of tremendous potential. And that is why Chinua Ajepe told us that until the lion learned the art of writing, all stories glorified the hunter. I think we have learned to write I think we have learned the art of writing. And that is why we are going to write our own narrative. That is the continent that we belong to. Let me also say another thing, opportunity. Yes, this climate crisis, climate change, and the climate crisis that comes with it, yes, it is true, we contributed the least. Yes, it is also true, we are suffering the most. But in this crisis is Africa's opportunity. And that is what we want to focus on. Africa's opportunity to unlock the tremendous resources that we have for green energy transition. And we must exploit this opportunity. And number three, so that I conclude, is that this is the continent that has the highest investment potential. We are only limited by two things. Number one, we are limited, as I said earlier in my statement, by high interest rates for development capital. Many of our countries, and we are here and they say figures don't lie, nine countries are already in debt, in debt distress in our continent, over the cliff. Thirteen countries are classified as uh, high risk, and another 17 countries are classified as moderate risk. And the biggest contributor to debt distress in our continent is high interest rates. We pay five times more than others, meaning that in fact, the architecture is set up in a manner that if you borrow, it will be difficult for you to pay. And that is why we need a conversation, and a very candid conversation, and we are saying this in all honesty around how do we get concessional funding? How do we pay? as much as others are paying? How do we get Africa away from paying five times more? And I asked in this gathering, we're not asking to be favored. We're not asking for to be treated differently. We want a fair financial system that treats everybody equally. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that is not too much to ask. A fair international financial architecture is not a fair proposition or an unfair proposition to make. Number two, many of our countries are headed into debt distress because of climate change. Let's be honest, we are suffering the most whether it is in the Sahel with drought, whether it is in the Horn of Africa with drought, whether it is in South Africa and the southern part of our continent with cyclones, and we are saying the suffering is across the globe, but we carry the biggest brand. I'll give you, I'll contextualize this. And because of climate change, we are forced to divert resources that are meant for economic growth into dealing with the effects of climate change. I will contextualize this. 
in Kenya, we lost two and a half million heads of livestock in northern part of Kenya. Combined with Ethiopia and Somalia and Djibouti, we lost nine and a half million heads of livestock. So what did I have to do in Kenya? So in Kenya, I've had to increase resources meant for school feeding from a million and a half children in school under school feeding, we've had to scale up this year to four million kids in school to be put under school feeding. And we've had to rearrange the budget to provide for that. So when we say climate change is destroying our economies, we are not making statements. We are making statements of fact. And that is what is driving many of our economies in that direction. And let me contextualize this further. When I was first elected as a member of parliament in a rural constituency in Kenya, I represented a community that is so proud that they think debt is not a good thing. They are risk averse and very debt averse. So, to try and encourage the community that time, then there was this phrase, and I want to uh, say it in, uh, in the indigenous community. There was a phrase that Kai Kai Kobaren Pesen Kosir Kobaren Panan. I will explain to you what that means. There is person and there is panan. Person is death. Panan is poverty. So it is said in this community, if you must die, it is better to die of death than to die of poverty. Because you are dying anyway. So it's... And so, to contextualize that into this debate, we don't want to die in this continent, we don't want to die of debt, but we also don't want to die of poverty. That is why we must have a conversation around multilateral development banks and concessional financing and how we can finance our economies using resources that do not punish us. And when we make this proposition, we have tremendous respect for our multilateral development banks. They are doing their best. We have the best of respect for them. But we believe they can do better. We, can be, we believe that there is an opportunity. We need to explore the SDR, Special Drawing Arts Rights Window. And this time round, we want to have that window when it's made available because it is possible. Let those who need the resources get, not those, who, not those who don't. In the last experience, those who did not need the resources got more than those who needed the resources. We need to have a paradigm shift this time round. And number two, we believe that it is possible to expand concessional uh, financing through leveraging on the balance sheets of these institutions. And finally, to be able to unlock the resources that we need to be able to drive these new investment and financing opportunities, especially for green energy. We believe it is time to have a conversation about carbon tax. I said we need to have a conversation about carbon tax. And I mean we need to have a conversation about carbon tax. Yes. We believe it's the only way, it's among the ways that we can raise 
additional and adequate resources for us to finance our development. And while we are thinking about financing, for us in Africa, three things are very important. As they say in Kenya, mambo ni matatu. Number one, speed. It takes inordinate to access any meaningful resources. Number two, it requires scale. Because we've all agreed that enormous resources are required. And number three, affordability. So that we all pay the same. And that is why this event is both Africa's climate summit and a global pre-COP28 convention. Africa is meeting and Africans are talking. The world is listening. We must use this opportunity to lead the world in a new direction towards a future that holds immense promise for both Africa and the entire world. The many initiatives showcased at this summit testify to the courage of African enterprise and innovators to pursue breakthroughs, exploit opportunities, develop models, and take risks to make our tomorrow better than our today. When the global talk take is released, there will be another opportunity to test our courage and resolve by asking each other hard questions in the spirit of fashioning the new way to achieve rapid improvements. We have therefore committed to conclude this summit with a declaration which will firmly encourage everyone to keep their promises, even in hard times, as a matter of justice, to hold each other to account, to collaborate, and to innovate. This African moment is a global moment. We are in word and deed, full stakeholders in this global journey and its primary navigators at this stage. I urge everyone at this summit to exercise bold leadership and contribute to our efforts to reconfigure global markets and international institutions around African aspirations and strategic goals. I call on each one of you to do their part so that the potential that lies in our continent can deliver opportunities for Africa's youth, communities, enterprises, and nations to actualize a future for all of us. It is a matter of long standing African wisdom that if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go with others. We have a long way to go and no time to lose. In this moment of existential urgency of whole humanity, I dare say that we have our ancestors' permission to innovate a way not only to go fast, but also go together. Provided we consult thoroughly, engage in good faith, collaborate effectively, and proceed inclusively. This is an emergency, and we must undertake climate action and green growth with this understanding. I thank you. God bless you. God bless Africa. Asante san. Your Excellency, you have some tasks to perform, so please come back to the stage. I have been requested to ask the climate envoy from America, who is scheduled to take a flight, to take a few moments and come and speak to us. My good brother John Kerry is somewhere in this audience. Welcome because he also has a 
declaration to make and an announcement to make. Welcome, John. <laughs>